Not exactly something that you would, you, know, you don't get pictures, generally see paintings of pictures of people <laughs> spitting. That's not, that's not a classical <laughs> image. And when he, when he does the spitting, he carefully, very carefully cuts out these, these uh, holes in the door. But the crazy thing is he lets you see everything behind the door. So it's like he's challenging you to like this. He says, this is just an adore, guys. How can you possibly like it? And, and then the interesting thing is that there's no color in it except for the color of the wood. It's grays and blacks and whites. The only color is in the frame of the bird for a picture, which is just the wood of the door itself. And then you have the, the image of this, this bird, which is um, coming out, of, coming in, a, is in the picture frame, but coming out into the, 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 um, the um, into the space of, of da the Dagwood-like figure, and also coming out into the observer's space. And the irony is the dog, the bird is coming out, but the head is going back. She's cut a hole in where the head is. And then, of course, you have this snowman figure, and this volcano-like thing. Who knows what's going on there? So you look at this, and, and it, he bashes in the door up there. If he cuts these nice holes in, he just bashes in two, cor two square things. Who knows what all this means, right? But when he did this painting, it was finished, and there's an interesting story Joan tells, which I'm going to recall. He finished the painting on January 1st, 1991, and he, came, he generally painted at night and came upstairs after he finished it. And Joan said, you know, he said, I just finished this great painting. And Joan said, um, I just read this poem by Elizabeth Bishop that I, I want you to read. And he read the poem. The poem is an interesting poem. Elizabeth Bishop is a, was a young writer. This was, the poem was written in the 1930s. She had, her father died when she was eight months old. Her mother went insane, was institutionalized, and she was brought up by relatives in Nova Scotia and Massachusetts. And finally went to Vassar and graduated from Vassar and was sort of, had moved to New York where she was sort of lost. She always had this love-hate relationship with New York, where she loved New York, but it also you know, made her disoriented and lost. And she wrote this poem called Man Moth. It was a misprint in the New York Times. They were trying to say mammoth, and she read it as, and they wrote it as Man Moth. And she wrote this poem, and, and there, you, the poem, we've got copies of it around. It's really a beautiful poem. It's worth, worth reading. And it has two images that are, that are um, that reflect this painting in a lot of ways. Because what happened is Jerry read the poem and he said, I just painted that poem. And in the poem, he, one of the characters is this moth who comes from the subterranean parts of New York and is trying to fly up through the sky and tries to fly through the hole in the sky, which is the moon. And of course, he never makes it. And then later in the poem, a man gets, um, and it's sort of a very surreal scene, but gets on, on the subway and is, is said to be facing the wrong way. So you can see where both the moth and the man facing the wrong way you know, are reflected in that poem. So I really like this, this painting a lot, and I asked my daughter, who's a writer in Marfa, Texas, actually, to take a look at it and comment on it. So she spent about two hours, is that right, Joan? Well, I just want to say one thing I forgot. Yeah, your connection, we got Rachel Monroe, who has the uh, foremost piece in the current New Yorker. Yeah, but anyway. So, yeah, Rachel, but. <laughs> Rachel spent a couple hours with this painting. Hours and, in the basement, and, yeah. And, and, in her essay, which is in the catalog, she, she says the thing that this painting reminded her of, the first image she thought of was Porky in Wacky Land. Are you all familiar with this classic? <laughs> I wasn't, but I want to share it with you because I think it, it, it does inform our, the way we look at this painting. So many things going on per unit too much to actually see, you know, you had to go back and look at it again and again, idea after idea after idea. And then as a sculptor, what I really loved was, I loved the way, and I guess it's Robert Clampett who's the cartoonist there, I loved the way, you know, a, a character would be running and running and running and stop and their neck would keep going and then come back again, you know, this, all this elasticity in that cartoon and in the Warner Brothers, in the whole Looney Tunes world. 
was brilliant. And if you look at it frame by frame, it's extraordinary how much drawing and how many ideas are going on that have to do with things getting squeezed and pushed and exploded and nothing, no surface really holds together for very long before some kind of transformation happens. And then I thought, you know, then looking at it again, I thought about working where he went, what an interesting combination it was between surrealism and vaudeville. And I thought, have I seen this before? Have I seen that marriage before? Certainly I've seen the one and the other, but and looking at that film and seeing, for example, the scene where, where uh, the figure with the, with the mannequin legs and the little stick figure body s stands aside and poses, you know, or all the bella figura poses of the dodo bird in triumph after having flummoxed Porky. There's all this wonderful vaudeville in those poems, and those remind me of Jerry's paintings, and this is what I thought, among other things, this is what I really found myself thinking, what an interesting connection it is. And so I want to go in that room, this one painting that sort of stayed in my eye. I'd love to go in and look at one of those paintings. Though I saw some of these paintings get made, or though I was around during the years when some of these paintings get, got made, it's really interesting that Joan and Paul and Reynolds have done is to give us the paintings again, in some cases 20 years later, and a chance to look at them from a very different cultural moment, artistic moment, art world moment. And so it's, it's really curious to compare what I thought of them then, or what I thought he was doing then, and what I see that he's doing now with all that we know in retrospect. And um, so among the thousand thoughts that I have with this one, and you can see this vaudevillian hand where in perspective the, the gesturing hand comes out and gets bigger and comes out in space, and the body goes back into pictorial space, and maybe this is a hand, but then what are all these? But the figure in the middle, um, I think is, there's things going on here that really anticipate some of what Paul's talking about, some of the ab abstraction that, that Paul's talking about. Um, so you can see the posing, you can see the vaudeville in these figures, and you can see the, the, um, the, 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 the oh, I'm groping here, sort of the, the, the cartoonish, sort of tongue-in-cheek, exaggerated hyperbole of gesture you can see in these works in this room, which all come from the 80s and I guess early 90s, Paul, you put them. Well, you these are all 80s, actually it's not. 80s, 90s, 90s and early aughts, yeah. Um, so I, one of the things I want just to talk about with this, but all the paintings, is the, is the, the, the vocabulary of ways of getting paint on the canvas. The, just the number of ideas, just like Bob Clampett had all those ideas about how he was going to build those figures and what he was going to have them do. Jerry has all these ideas about how to scratch or squeegee or paint, or in the case of this mouth, very, very carefully render, almost in realism, um, image after image, and then wipe it out and then develop it and work on it again. And for me, this painting, is it barely holds together in a kind of crazy painterly chaos. So you see it and it's like, I love what Paul said, you know, he's asking you to like it. He's asking us to respond to this composition, a composition that in every moment is sliding off the canvas and, and sliding around and falling down and, um, and interrupting himself with a thousand things. And, um, but I looked again, and this is the other thing I wanted to mention with my little chat here was, I think of that, what rivets us about all the paintings that Jerry did is, has maybe something to do with the contradiction. I think a lot of really great art is born out of um, a, a kind of incompatible two things or three things being done at once and the contradictions and the hypnosis that comes from the fight between those things. So 
here we have this antic painting, but it's executed with the most lyrical, and I'm hoping David will tell us, I, I forgot to look that word up, lyrical, the most exquisite, liquid, visceral lyricism. And these two things are made to go together in this painting. And I, I especially thought, you know, the way this head is constructed out of a set of really fast, very wet on wet paint. And then this, I don't know if you can see it from back there, but there's a river flowing out of this eye. And it reminded me of those famous, that famous sequence that Picasso did, studies for the weeping woman in Guernica, um, of, of the weeping eye. And by the end, there's a famous sequence there. And just before the painting, the finished painting was executed, Picasso had the eyes had been turned into boats, and the boats were turning over, and out from the boats come the tears, and there were these sort of capsized eyes. And I thought about that, but then I also thought about this wonderful book that, when I first met Carlton, he turned me on to this book called Sensitive Chaos, which was written, I can't remember when, it's a series of photographs of fluid phenomena. Um, all kinds of fluid phenomena, especially a set of photographs of um, a rod drawn through viscous liquid. There's a series of photographs taken in um, time lapse so that they could be slowed down so that the behavior of the vortices and eddies in the, in the wake of the rod could be captured on film. And later in the book, um, Theodore Schwenk, who writes the book, compares these things that are mi in micro time, compares them with longer duration events that follow the same kinds of patterns. But look at this crazy ball and socket pattern on the left. And does it not somehow, it certainly put me in mind of the sluice work of liquids going on to make this face. Um, and all, you know, as you look around, all of the ways, all the paint handling that I think we celebrate Jerry for and that in different ways deliver and withhold and then re-deliver the images that, that we've come to love in the paintings. Um, and I just, you know, I just, this mouth here is so, it's, it's so obscene and so, <laughs> so, <laughs> fantastic and so fleshy and so slightly wet and so, you know, it's almost as if he's painted a beautiful illusion of, of if not spit flying through space, then spit, uh, you know, then spit barely held, barely held in and then surrounded with, you know, I think he was a master of, of and again, I have to quote Carlton, the liquid issue. I think Jerry was a master of the liquid issue. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do a micro talk um, that'll be uh, short. Uh, but since I'm a writer, it's got to start with an epigraph. And the epigraph is from somebody who, in spirit, seems to be very close to, uh, to uh, Donato, and that is uh, John Cage. And he has this wonderful comment where he says, Get yourself out of whatever cage you find yourself in. And if your name is John Cage, it's, <laughs> it's especially tough. But um, there is a sense uh, to me uh, in which uh, Donato understands art as a, as, as a set of conventions and in some ways a set of cages. And the job is to get yourself out of the cage that you find yourself in. Um, and I think he did that in particular through this invention of the, his own version of the trickster. And the trickster is uh, you know, Paul Monroe's dodo. Uh, it's the, uh, the figure who is uh, absolutely the representative of anarchy, uh, who does exactly what the good person is not supposed to do. And to me, this is, uh, you know, this, accounts for the impulse to, to bash some holes in a door that, uh, that shouldn't be bashed. It, it accounts for the impulse to refuse the sense that art has to be highly serious. Uh, 
it's a kind of 19th century notion that in literature we associate with, uh, with Matthew Arnold, that the great work uh, reflects high seriousness. But, I mean, for me, it, this piece over here where you put Mr. Man's head on the, the torso of a, a buxom woman is, is exactly the, uh, the trickster uh, at work, uh, giving us something that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there. Uh, but it is. Uh, one of the things that impresses me most about uh, Jerry's work is that, is that it always makes me feel happy. I, I think uh, Elizabeth feels that way too. And I was trying to put my finger on what it is that makes me feel happy about it. And I, what I came up with is that it's playful. Uh, that as opposed to sort of reaching for high seriousness, uh, he sees the importance of, of the play element in human culture and uh, kind of retrieves it for, uh, for, for serious art. So this is art that is serious, but it's, its seriousness has to do with embracing a kind of, a, a kind of playfulness. Uh, I wanted to, to leave you with, with two facts, since all this has been conjecture. And uh, the, the first fact, um, is it seems significant to me what people put on their license plates. I mean, you can have dozens of tattoos, so a tattoo doesn't tell me much of anything if you got more than one. But you only have one license plate, and Jerry's license plate uh, had the word doubt. Um, and, and I think the doubt was not like a philosophical skepticism, like there is no truth, um, but it's that everything needs to be questioned. Uh, even the artwork, the cage, you may have invented your own cage in the 80s, and you need to get out of it in the, in the 90s. Uh, and if that's what's happening in the exhibition that uh, Paul Monroe has put together, it is, I think, in the, in the spirit of, of John Cage. The other was the title, which was actually a, a quotation when he was being interviewed and realized that it should be the title of his retrospective. And he called it Reinventing the Game. <laughs> and so in some ways, you know, art as play has a lot of game involved in it. Uh, but the job of the artist, uh, the, the playful artist, is to reinvent it in some way. And I guess if you can see all the way through to this uh, painting against the wall, it would be my sort of example of how the trickster uh, takes the world and turns it, as Paul Monroe was saying, upside down. Uh, in fact, it's literally upside down. The, the painter is, uh, is in space in a way that uh, he certainly shouldn't be. Uh, I think one of the books uh, that connects with me about Jerry is, is Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift where Hyde is arguing against the commercialization and the commodification of the artwork. I think that's one thing that play does. It says, no, you're not gonna take this into the uh, Metropolitan Museum and uh, charge a bundle for it. That's not, that's not what this art is about. This art is about exploring imagination, exploring a kind of dream space. So he's got a, the figure of, of the painter who's kind of a house painter. So there's the, the painter who actually is, you know, decorating your walls. Uh, and then there's the Mr. Man figure who is the trickster who's turning it all upside down. This is, I think, the only Mr. Man picture where there's, it looks like he might actually be smoking something. And uh, <laughs> again, Cherry leaves it up to us to decide what it is that he might be smoking. There's, for me, I guess if there was one word that would connect, for, at least for the early Donatus for me, it's, it's kind of dreamscapes. That is, they're, they're sort of innerscapes that exist only in the mind of Donato. Uh, and you have to be sort of Donato to get there. Uh, but there, there is no anchoring in the external world. There's the figures who matter most to him, a paternal figure, uh, a woman figure, a love figure. Um, Mr. Man is the alter ego. Both two figures in a boat. These, these figures are almost like figures in a dream. We don't quite know what they mean, but in a dream we never know what things mean. We know they mean something. 
I mean, Freud was wrong. <laughs> if, a, sometimes a cigar is only a cigar, but that's when you're holding it in your hand. When it's in your head, it's, there's something more. It's, a, it's an image of a cigar, and that image uh, can speak in ways that, that we don't know. Anyway, uh, you know, breakfast for me is, uh, is a terrific time because I get to wake up with a lot of Donatos, and there's, there's always more to say about them. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> How about movement from being a printmaker into being an artist, uh, that evolution? Yeah, that was, that was an interesting, because he really started as a printmaker, was not a painter, and yeah. taught himself to be a painter, really. Mm -hmm. And the printmaking is really, be, even before the 80s, the 70s and early 80s, and I, I can't count, you know, you know more about what he was no, I'm going to ask Joan when that happened. Did it happen well, all he was, You know, I, I told the story of in school, it was always Donato, if you could only paint like you can draw. And uh, he was, he had Feigen, he had a really good gallery in New York for his prints, but he really wanted to paint. And we went up to New York in 76, lived on the Bowery, he'd paint all night. We had to get to bed before the rooster in the chicken hatchery behind us started crowing. And he'd look at art all day. And he really taught himself to paint, not on that trip. It took a long time, but he, he really did teach himself. Was that the answer? Yeah. But he, kept he did keep doing, but the monotypes, yeah, which really were sort of singular paintings, mm -hmm. but additions. But I think he kept evolving. I mean, he was not an artist that, that found an answer. I mean, he went from printmaking to teaching himself painting, to doing these paintings, to doing those paintings. And it was never, you know, he, he never settled. He was like the moth. He never really settled. He kept, kept trying to push the limits, to get out that hole. And you had the insight that when he started doing the work in the 90s, there are many fewer works on paper. Yeah, I, I, we couldn't find a lot of works on paper, and he, and he only did big paintings. He didn't do paintings you could put in your house easily, right? I mean, he, he insisted on going for it and doing what he thought was important. And, and it wasn't important for him to sell things, right, Joan? No, he had his work not for sale. Really. Yeah, because he, 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 he didn't want to sell it. <laughs> Any other comments, sir? What, what, when you chose the work, what, what how does the show unfold in your mind? Because this is a selection from a huge body of work. Of well, we went, we went downstairs, and, and it really was that, I thought it was, I, it was interesting to see the work, how it changed. I was really interested in the work from the 90s, because I really felt there were, it was mysterious. I didn't understand this, you know, I didn't understand the symbolism, and it was real un, unfamiliar to me. The more I looked at the work, the more I said, you know, this is quirky. I, I don't, I can't get my head around it, but it's, but it's really interesting. The more you look at it, if you look at some of those paintings, the couple, which is the painting on the back wall, the large one, with the strange green color and the strange orange color, you know? I'm saying, why would someone pick those colors? I mean, he, he knew exactly what colors he was picking out. But then when we hung the show, it was interesting, the painting on the back wall, the Buddha painting on the, back, on the far back wall, has the same colors. And, and I went, looked today, when they were painting, they were painting in 92. He, and according to Joan, he went and found this cheap painting of Lowe's. And he said, no, I, you may not want to paint it. Let me this all up. Well, you, <laughs> right. You don't want to paint your room this color, but I can make a good painting out of this color. You know, because I can't, I can't look at that painting and, and, and not see those colors. You know. Um, and not but it, think it kept, of a story. But and kept, think of yeah. Kept seeing more and more things that I didn't recognize the first time around. More cutouts. We were looking at that at the Buddha painting this afternoon. Yeah. yeah. And we kept seeing these little gestures and these strange ways of putting paint on. The cutting away is such a printmaker's action too. That's true, that's you know, good. And also, you know, the scratching, a lot of the things have mm -hmm. scratching and clawing marks in them, which also strikes me as a, as a, um, a printmaker's instinct. So the doors seem to really go back to negative space, thinking positive, negative, cutting in, um, it's really interesting. Yeah, and then in, in that same painting, the, the Buddha painting in the back, and as well as the, the boy and bird, the wood is chiseled out in some places to make a texture, 
or uh, I mean, it just does. He really used the wood in in ways that a painter wouldn't ordinarily think. You don't learn chiseling in, in on a Lowe's door. <laughs> well, you don't learn it in art school, right? They don't have an FMA in, in chisel. FMA. FMA. I mean, FMA. MBA. Yeah. That's so great. Chisel, I like that. If, if I can just jump, can I say one thing? Sure. Um, Donato was one of my drawing instructors my sophomore year at VCU. And it's been interesting to hear things that you guys have said because he really did encourage experimentation and playfulness. And he really kind of pushed me to continue to just have openness with the material and um, kind of whatever happens, you know? And was always very um, energetic very energetic, um, and you know, just kind of open to different ideas and what can happen with art. And so, I just yeah, the teacher. Well, that's good. I mean, we didn't emphasize that, but teaching is really important. For yeah. That's why that's why the money from any sales go to to a, a prize for undergraduates, mm -hmm. which is you know continues that that legacy. Is there anybody else here who was a student? You never really know what goes on in the classroom with someone else. It's really <laughs> private. Well, Maybe there's no story. story. <laughs> the students always have strong. I mean, I had, I had, a, my, I was in yoga last week, and someone said, "Oh, you have a Donato show," and this was a, a, an older, not someone as old as I am. But she said, "I went to art school kind of late, late in life," and she loved Donato. She said he was, he was an incredible teacher, but. First time I met him, he said, you're awfully old to be going to art school. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he really let it hang out. I mean, he, he got what you got, right? Um, he was balls out, man. <laughs> yeah, there was no holding back. And these paintings, yeah. I mean, these paintings, one of the reasons we picked the, the fresh was because he was fresh. Yes. But yeah, like it was a fresh it. look, but, but <laughs> this, these works looked like they could have been painted last year. You know, I mean, I think a painter that produced these in the last year would, would be happy that they're topical. Yeah. That's what you were saying. I mean, I that's a so whole too. other subject that... I mean, the whole issue of gender, the whole issue of posing, yeah. the whole issue of, of, of a persona, of a constructed persona, these are all things that are so huge now in different ways in, yeah. in, in that world. Yeah, you bring up gender. I mean, he was really playing with that mm -hmm. gender mix. I mean, so again and again in paintings, there's someone who's looking and someone who's being looked at. And it tends to go in the, in the expected way. A man is looking, a woman is modestly looking down. But there are paintings which women, the female figures, are looking too. Um, I don't know if they're ogling or leering, but they're, de <laughs> they're definitely paying attention. So the images of of the act of looking, I think, is another theme that runs through all the paintings and it's really interesting. We have one that's sort of on extended loan from you and Jerry that has a figure with, with its back to us in the foreground, a little bit like that beautiful single figure there. And then over the shoulder of that figure is, is a, a panorama of events happening. And so you look at it yourself, but then you also look at it through the interlocutor, through the, the witness. And I think the act of witness is in a lot of the paintings. Yeah, um, Paul and Ian talked about Casper David Friedrich and the, the you know, looking out, seeing looking it from or seeing the, the it opening from, of Moby Dick. Yeah, the world over, there are people at the ends of docks looking out to sea. Of course, I'm not doing it justice, but that image. Of, people all over the globe just standing and staring out. And water is such a big subject in these paintings. If, it's, if they're not watery, they're paintings of water, or of boats in water, or of things underwater. And I love Eleanor, who said that she loves the, who said, first you said miasma, and then you said no. That's her own word. And you said, I love the miasma everything is in. <laughs> It's just great. It's such a such a wonderful way of paying attention to all the sort of dreamy and indistinct and fluid things that are going on all around and inside and through 
the, the things that we can recognize. Uh, Jen, if you don't, if you don't mind, um, I'm curious as to how you guys sort of lived with it, particularly the sort of dreamscape aspect of a lot of what's going on. Like, is it how did it sort of interact with your lives? And like, did you did you have feedback? Did you say, oh, well, this is that thing or that thing, or was there a conversation? Like, talking that about seems, the word? Yeah. Okay, you know, I mean, we would just sit and talk about each other's work forever. And I was sort of the first one to pull out because you know he was a teacher and he was older and I thought I just need to listen to my own voice. But we, you know, we would talk endlessly, but really I struggled to remember what we talked about because it wasn't so much this means this or this means that. So, but this, things would certainly come to light, you know, but really often even other people would tell us, well, that guy with the mustache, that's your father. And Jerry and I both go, oh my God, <laughs> it is. And the rose, you know, people would always say, oh, that's John, and I think that is not my body. And the rose and the hair, and it was his mother and the cross. So, but it's been, it's just very interesting for me to hear from other people their takes on things. But the... The man moth, that, it was so funny because most, almost everything is untitled. That was one of the few things he wrote Bird and Boy on. And when he came up and he said, I just painted this painting, we, we referred to it as man moth ever after. So that one, I think, more. So that effort is part of then what's, what gets pictured from us when we look at it. And I think, I think that we leave the show with, with a sense of, of an artist um, not just singing his heart out, but also really reaching and using all the tricks he can think of, both representational ones, painterly ones, um, compositional ones, and ones having to do with the surface itself, the physical object itself, messing with them all, hoping, hoping. But I would never dare to put in words what it was he, you know, what it was he was trying to summon into into existence, although I think it's here. I think these are soulful paintings. And the, the accomplishment of that makes us all a little smarter and a little more capable of ourselves, right? We all win something when an artist accomplishes what, what some of these paintings have accomplished. We all, so we're all leaves are full of ourselves because we can, you know, we, we can enact a little bit just, just in looking at them.